Don't apologize, organize. That's what we're talking about today. Hi, this is Frank Buck, and this is the place to be if you want to get organized and make it look easy. My guest today is Julie Bestry. Julie, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to be here. Julie and I have gotten to know each other over the last, oh, what, three years or so through both of us being guests on um, these you know, virtual summits of various types, uh, all centered around the subject of productivity. Now, Julie, I'm going to put you on the spot. Are you old enough to remember the Donnie and Marie variety show that used to be on? I'm a little bit country and I'm a little bit rock and roll. Absolutely. You are, <laughs> you are reading my mind and I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes because probably most of the people who are listening to us go are going, who? But, you know, for those who- I have, think you just called me old. <laughs> oh, hey, Julie, we're both there. Let's, you know, we're, we're seasoned. We're not old. We're both seasoned. But, uh, you know, for the people who follow me, you know, I really push the boundaries digitally. Um, I feel like there are a lot of people that want to go digital, but they need a good system of how to do it. So I've tried to provide those answers. You are doing the same thing for the paper folks. So the people who are tuning in, who are normally hearing about Remember the Milk and, and all kind of digital things, uh, this is going to be this is going to be different. So if you'll allow me, I'm going to read a little bit of your bio so that people know a little bit more about you. So actually, I'm going to take uh, a, a note in Evernote and just slide it over so that it's right in front of me where I can send my look at the camera as uh, as I read the bio. Uh, but Thanks Julie, for the B win. <laughs> yeah. Julie Bastry is a certified professional organizer, certified Evernote expert, and president of Best Results Organizing in Chattanooga, Tennessee. In her previous career, in a fast-paced, detail-oriented, and wacky world of television broadcasting, Julie developed a passion for inspiring good organizing skills and systems, I love the word systems, with patience and humor, two really good things to have. Julie particularly loves eliminating paper chaos and motivates her overwhelmed residential home office and small business clients with the motto, don't apologize, organize. In addition to helping her clients save time and money, reduce stress and increase productivity in a guilt-free environment. Guilt-free is another good one. Julie's often interviewed by media and presents teleclasses and workshops. She's the author of the book, 57 Secrets for Organizing Your Small Business. She blogs as Paper Doll and writes various organizing theme, themed articles and ebooks, including Do I Have to Keep This Piece of Paper and the popular Tickle Yourself Organized. And I'll put links to all this in the show notes because I know you're, you're going to want to check this out. A 20 year veteran member of the National Association of Productivity and Organizing Professionals, Julie has achieved Golden Circle veteran status and has served on the Board of Certification for Professional Organizers. Locally, she sits on the Board of Directors for Chattanooga's Partners and Peers for Diabetes Care. Julie is a native of Buffalo, New York, and holds a Bachelor of Science from Cornell University and a Master of Arts from Syracuse University. Julie loves organizing paper and setting up filing systems, hates paper clips, I do too, and does not answer the telephone during primetime TV. And folks, we have that option. We can choose to answer that phone or not. She believes in controlling her schedule instead of letting her schedule control her. And she's decidedly not a morning person. She wants you to know that you can replace the chaos in your life or business with serenity. So again, Julie, welcome. It is a pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you, Frank. And I have to say, I appreciate you understanding that I'm not a morning person and recording this in the afternoon. <laughs> you are more than welcome. Definitely more than welcome. So um, you're a paper person. 
or at least hy hybrid. I'm I'm a hybrid. I I began when I began. Mm -hmm. That's all there was when I worked in television. Yeah. Um, I uh, you'll you'll hear me say this on on in lots of places. There, there's an old expression in the land of the blind, the one eyed man is king. And while it's a horribly ableist expression, yes. what it means <laughs> is that um, if you have a little bit of knowledge in, in a particular area, that takes you far when you're surrounded by people who don't have that area of expertise. And when yes. I began working in television, I had had email back in the 80s before there was an internet wow. um, because Cornell University had, had made that available. So when I got into the television industry, nobody knew what e email was. None of the, the managers or any, anybody at the director level had uh, was using computers. Everybody had secretaries. And so mm -hmm. I was able to be a little more nimble. So I am obviously as an Evernote a, a certified expert and, and in all of the other ways in my life, I am certainly um, comfortable in the digital world. But paper is where my heart is because I feel like if you understand the concepts to apply them to paper, mm -hmm. it works to apply them digitally. And the reverse is not always true. And most of the people still, after all of these years, who come to me are overwhelmed, even if they're overwhelmed in both environments, the overwhelm in paper is what is stopping them from being able to move forward. So I am paper doll and yes. I do love organizing paper, but I definitely operate in a hybrid way with, with one foot in each realm. I think my friends from college who were all engineers uh, would be surprised to find that my clients think of me as, as a techie sort of expert. <laughs> but but again, in the in that land where where somebody needs to lead, I feel like both paper and digital, I have found a hybrid path. Yeah. So there's not a right and a wrong. It's not that digital is better than paper. But how would you help a person decide which is better for them, the digital or the paper? Well, I mean, I think we first have to start at, at looking at what we're talking about because um, a digital calendar versus paper calendar has some crossover, but some different elements from note taking. So mm -hmm. for example, the research shows that if you are taking notes to learn, that your brain is a, able, better able to capture information and comprehend it if you handwrite your notes, because if you're typing your notes, you tend to be a stenographer. You write, right. you type everything mm -hmm. you hear. Whereas nobody can handwrite as quickly as, as the speaker is imparting information. So people are much better about writing key thoughts and, and, mm -hmm. and, and the essentials and sort of translating from the language of the professor, for example, to the language we use every day. So if you're at a conference, for example, or um, if you're uh, in graduate school, you probably should be handwriting your notes to get the most out of learning. However, if you are in the conference room with your boss and several others of your, your colleagues, and your job is just to keep track of of the key things that happen. You wanna mm -hmm. figure out whose action items are, are going to be, who is going to be responsible for, for these different action items, then taking your notes in Evernote with, with your computer is going right. to work fine. Um, so it could be situational rather than um, the entire environment. So for example, I take, notes when I'm when I'm talking with clients, for example, or prospective clients. Um, everybody who reads my blog knows I use purple legal pads. They're great for when I'm at client locations because mm -hmm. if I put it down in a in a crowded room, I'm going to spot that purple paper against mm -hmm. the background of anything else there. But the, these situations depend, you know, it all depends on where I am. If if I am um, at a meeting, uh, I'm probably going to pull, pull out my, um, my iPad with the Bluetooth keyboard and mm -hmm. take some quick notes. Um, 
calendars are very different. I find that if, if you tend to stay in one place most of the time, so mm-hmm. if you're desk bound, if you are not, um, if you are not going hither and, and yon, um, a paper planner can work really well for you. If you're the sort of person who needs what a paper planner offers, which is um, landmarks, you know, we can color code when we're doing something on, mm-hmm. um, you know, on a Google calendar or an Apple calendar, but for, for people who are tactile, who want to pick a particular color blue among their markers or, or red, or they want to draw little insignias or, or they want to draw a line through things, you can do that much faster and, and more innate to how you think on a paper planner. So if mm-hmm. you are not ne- necessarily a linear thinker, a paper planner is great. You're, you're a more situational person. If, right, however, yeah. you're extremely linear, if you are a just the facts, ma'am kind of person, then a digital calendar might be better for you. But again, there's a hybrid approach. And you and I talked about this when we were planning talking that I have a, um, I have a paper planner. It's got, it's got heft. It's got weight. Um, it's where I put anything that is an appointment where I have to be somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And, and I take my planner with me. It goes in my bag if I'm going to clients. However, I use the digital calendar. I use the, uh, the Outlook for Mac calendar for when I have something that's going to be specific to a time that I have to be sitting in front of my computer. So that's either going to be a phone call or mm-hmm. more likely something like this, like a Zoom, because if Excellent. somebody like, so you sent me an invitation to so this that link. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. And so I'm able to keep all of that information. I can't write a Zoom link in so, handwriting yeah. Zoom link in my in my paper planner. Mm-hmm. So my paper planner says Frank podcast and, and the time of day today. Okay. But but in my digital calendar, it has color coded what kind of appointment this is. And I know that I can click on it and I have the time, the information, the, the Zoom link and everything that I'm going to need. So it is, it is important for people to remember that there's no completely right or completely wrong way mm-hmm. to approach paper or digital. It's what do you need under what circumstances? So yeah. I consider myself a paper planner person, but that doesn't mean that I don't use the digital calendar. I use the elements that work. Somebody, um, I, I still remember um, there was a TV show in the 80s called 30 something. Okay. And yep. I wasn't even 30 something when I watched it, but I remember a <laughs> character saying, religion is not a salad bar. You can't take what you want and leave the rest. And I feel like everything with productivity, I'm not even going to discuss religion, but everything with productivity and organizing is a salad bar. You can take the good, healthy vegetables and leave Mm -hmm. that weird jello with the marshmallows because it doesn't work for you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't know you were going to talk about weird jello and weird jello. (laughs) That's okay. Tell us uh, what planner do you use? The the paper planner of choice for you? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting that you say that because for years, for about 18 years or so, I used the, the Franklin Covey planners. Uh, I know so, it well. so the, mm-hmm. the, the classic size, I like it because it's, it's sort of fat and thick and heavy. It feels substantial. And I still have the, you know, purple is my color and it's sort of an eggplant leatherette uh, outer form. But for the last few years, I've been using the Emily Lay, it's L-E-Y inserts. Um, they're um, they're slightly less expensive. They are very mm-hmm. pretty. And, and I found that I really wasn't using, I was using the monthly pages extensively, Mm -hmm. but again, as we go digital, we're more likely to have things in the cloud or things on the computer. And so I wasn't needing as much information on the daily pages. And so instead of having the the Franklin Covey daily pages where I had a, a two page spread for um, for, for every, every day, day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, this now has um, 
one spread on each page and the weekend days, um, Saturdays at the top and, and Sundays below. And I find that that has just enough room for, for me to keep track of the tasks that I have assigned myself for the day. Now, all that being said, if I am recommending a paper planner to a client who is overwhelmed, I recommend pay, uh, planner pads. Planner pads yes, uh -huh. are wonderful uh, for people who aren't familiar. It has, um, it has a funnel mechanism. So at the top, there are sections for, for really um, isolating each category or project in your life. And then the middle mm -hmm. section uh, is task oriented by day. By day. And then the mm -hmm. bottom part is um, calendar hour by hour by day. And I find that it's, uh, it's very straightforward. It's very simple. And it allows people to, to really get that big picture view of each week um, without feeling overwhelmed. The only drawback to the planner pads is it's not, for want of a better word, it's not pretty. And some of my clients mm -hmm. are, are just, you know, bummed out that they don't have something pretty, even if they're using markers. And aesthetics can be important sure. if yeah. aesthetics are what draw you to something. So I tell people, you can still decorate the cover. Um, washi tape, it's this Japanese decorative tape you can you can get all sorts of different stuff from like uh, staples or or office depot and you can decorate you get a plain black i think there are two covers there's like black or sort of a a mossy green but if you get the black cover you can apply any sort of of washi tape or stickers or mm -hmm. or whatever is going to appeal to you and again aesthetics are only important to function if they draw you to your system. So if a system yes. is unattractive to you and you're not going to use it, then making it attractive is important. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a real, I'm really about function. So I don't need, I don't need something too pretty. It just needs to be a little bit pretty. You I know? got it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'll put a link to the planner pad in the, in the show notes. I actually, I have one that, um, the president of the company at the time sent me, you know, one just complimentary to look at because I was mm -hmm. doing, you know, gosh, 20 years ago, workshops on paper. You know, mm -hmm. uh, 2001 was when I went to the digital side. But before that, uh, me and my daytimer. So, oh, yeah, uh, yeah that very much like the, the Franklin, you know, the two pages, at, uh, two, two page per day. So over on the left hand page, there are my appointments, there are my to do's on the right hand page, there are the notes from phone calls, one on one meetings, basically any place, anything you needed to write down, kind of like the memo pad by the phone, when you needed to jot something down, that's where you jotted it down. So I think you've revealed the secret to how a planner pad person would handle taking notes and it's like the legal pad, you know, the mm -hmm. purple legal pad that, so your planner pad, there's your, there are your appointments, there are your to-dos, there are your notes about various projects you've got going on. And then all of the, the things you need to jot down during the day, the phone calls, the, you know, that just have the legal pad with you and you're, you're set. It, so, it works yeah. for me. And, yeah. and the one thing that I tell people with, with the legal pad is I date every page. Mm -hmm. And so if I need to track when something happened, uh, if somebody calls me and said, I would swear we talked about this, but I can't find my notes. I can look at my calendar and see the date that I talked to that person and flip to that page in the legal pad that's dated. And, and I, I basically have have a court reporter, a stenographer's <laughs> record of, of, of what happened, which is so good that we don't have to depend upon our memories because mm -hmm. I, I am lucky that I do have a very sharp memory, but I think we've all seen that modern life with everything technology puts in our face, all those dopamine hits of, of you know, everything that's on YouTube and, and, and TikTok, Plus, having gone through more than two years of this pandemic, our brains just aren't as crisp mm -hmm. and clear as, as they might have been. And so having a record of everything yes. that happens to you 
takes the stress off you. You don't have to think of mm -hmm. something. Instead, you can think in context about it. And, and yes. I think that, that, that that's a real key. Mm -hmm. When I talk to principals and I talk to teachers, you know, we, we were always told in college, you got to document, you know, you're going to have those meetings with parents, you got to document, you got you know, those phone calls from parents, you got to document, yeah. but nobody ever told us how or where, and especially nobody ever made it easy enough that I would actually do it. And so having something as simple as a legal pad, and it's the same legal pad each time, not want this one today and that one tomorrow. And, you know, you don't want six legal pads running around, <laughs> but where it's, it's that same legal pad and where today leaves off, then tomorrow starts right after that dated. And, uh, you know, I, I remember in particular my first year as an assistant principal and this, this hot letter I had gotten from a parent about something that I had, you know, I talked to her about the matter, had really handled the matter. Um, and when you read her letter, it just made me out to just be like a bumbling idiot because she <laughs> talked about on this particular day, she had talked to me and on this date and on this date. And I just went to back to my day timer and no, her dates were, were just fictitious. And so <laughs> when I was able to go back to my day timer and actually show people here, here's what that entire day looked like. And here at this particular time, this is what I, here's this phone call with this parent. And here is what we talked about. And here are my notes as far as what I was going to do as a follow up. Then her little letter just became like, you know, it was in the fiction section of the, uh, of the <laughs> library. So, I mean, you know, the documentation can save you. I have a, a friend who, um, was a principal and now is actually a dean uh, of college of education at the collegiate level. And so uh, he would keep his, he kept a paper journal of mm -hmm. these, these type of things. And he said, when he filled up one, he put the old one in the vault at school because that documentation was that important to him. And the whole thing was, you know, you're taking the documentation as you're talking, it's not something extra you're doing. It's as you're talking, you're writing. When the phone call is over, the documentation's over as well. So uh, I think most people have, as you said, they haven't been taught how to take contemporaneous notes. Uh -huh. And I think, um, you know, here's a good example. Um, my mom had some surgery a few years ago. And we were waiting and it was taking much longer than it was supposed to. And I was getting very nervous. The doctor came down to talk to me and he started talking about what had happened. And I started taking notes mm -hmm. and um, we had a friend of the family with us. And I said, he, he said, please don't take notes. You're, you're not going to be able to keep up with this sort of just let this wash over you. And the, the friend of the family started laughing. She was like, let her take notes. Mm -hmm. He said everything. I stopped, I took a breath, I reread the notes. And then I said back to him, my understanding, again, not taking um, a transcription of what he said, but trying to clarify the meaning behind mm -hmm. each thing he said. So when I was able to do that, I then had in mind the questions that I wanted to ask him. And he, I think was a little shaken that, that I was prepared, but that's how my mind works. That if I take notes, my brain processes the information. Now, not everybody is mm -hmm. like that, but I think that if you are taking notes about what somebody says and, and you, know, you can't always stop somebody and say, hey, could, could, could you stop there and explain this? Because it, it, you know, it impacts the, their flow of information but you can make a little note in the corner. You can make like a little question mark that, that you have a follow-up question or you can make a little star. Mm -hmm. But if you just sit and listen to somebody and you don't take any notes, particularly when, when you're on the phone or goodness gracious, if you try to um, multitask and check your email or do your laundry or do anything else mm -hmm. while you're listening to the person, you are removing focus. It's, it's disrespectful to the person but it's also mm -hmm. disrespectful to your future self because you are guaranteeing that there are going to be details that you 
will have missed because you didn't give it your focus. So mm -hmm. that's what I try and teach my clients. Uh, when we're on the phone, when we talk about what our next appointment will, will be, um, if they haven't um, already scheduled in advance, I say, okay, well, I'll wait while you write it on your calendar. And some of them will laugh and say, oh, you know, I won't write it down if you don't make me write it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it's just, I know that if I wait for them to capture that information, they're building a ritual. They're, they're using that muscle to take information down as we speak and to capture information immediately rather than waiting. And, you know, I try and model that good behavior. Um, I am by no means perfect, but the truth is I do it. You know, I've got one of those coffee mugs that says, uh, organized people are just too lazy to look for things. Absolutely. I don't want to have to search. I don't want to have to stress. And so mm -hmm. if I do it all up front, I can be as lazy as I want because it's all right there. You know, to me, so much of it is making things easy. Let, let's face it. As people, we want to do the, we do the easy thing. So let's, let's make the right thing easy so that we'll, yeah so that we'll actually do it and um yeah i talk all the time about the right to forget about it you know when when you put it on that legal pad when you put it on that calendar when you put it in the system you earn the right to forget about it and you have the confidence that you haven't forgotten something you know that it's all there and you're and describing you, why I love the tickler files. So oh, much. yeah. You know, and you can hang up the phone and go right on to the next thing. Because how many times you, you hang up the phone and the phone rings again immediately? Or there's somebody at the door that needs your attention right now. And there's not any time at that point to write down any notes or in, anything from. So when you're finished with that phone call, you've taken the notes. It, it, it's there. You can now move on and be 100% there with the next thing instead of part of you still hanging on to the last thing going, I got to write it down. I got to write it down. I can't forget. I can't forget. Well, I think this is a good segue. The tickler file. Now, you know, I'm a very digital person, but for me, number one, there's still some paper in my life. Not a whole lot, but there's still some. And second, it is it is such a good um, oh, what's the word uh, analogy to, uh, to to the the digital side of things. Tell us about how you use your. Well, first of all, I, I think a lot of people who follow me for a long time know what a tickler file is. But for those who don't, talk to us about what it is and give us some of your use cases. Okay. Well, a tick conceptually, a tickler file is a place to park your action paperwork, very, very conceptually. Now, um, in terms of a tangible tickler file, uh, what I get is a, um, it's an accordion file binder with 42 tabs. It's got one through 40, did I say that right? Yes, so 43, yeah. 43 tab. Yeah. It's got yeah. one through 31. Some of mm -hmm. them have 30 and 31 in the same in the, in the same slot. They're, they're cheating. But one through 31 and then January to December. And the mm -hmm. January to December is very important because not everything that you need to do needs to be done this month. Right. So um, you can do it that way or you can make those 43 tabs by just having 43 folders in uh, desktop file box numbered one through 31, and then labeled January through December to go beyond that. So you can either buy them ready-made or, um, and, and, and I have a link on my, uh, on my website under the, the resources section, but um, you can either buy them ready-made or, or make them. But the key is that anything that comes into your life that triggers a task that you need to perform. So it can be something that comes in external to you. Um, I got a postcard from my dentist, mm -hmm. okay? Reminding me that I have a dental appointment and they, they need me to do something with some paperwork that's different from usual. Well, my dental appointment isn't for a month. So 
I can go ahead and put it in the slot for the day of my appointment, or I can even put it in the slot for the day before my appointment to make sure I, I, I fill it out. You get the paperwork that, that comes in the mail regarding, um, you know, you have to get your car emissions checked. I had to stop mm-hmm. and think because Tennessee just ended car emissions <laughs> she checks this year. Uh, but you have external information that comes by paper that comes that tr- is going to trigger an action that you have to perform at some point in the future. Some things have a specific date or some things you're going to have to say, hmm, when is it reasonable for me to be able to do this? This piece of paper uh, requires me to call and have a discussion with the physician or with the customer, but that person's not going to be available on Tuesdays and Fridays. So I'm going to slot it on a Wednesday of next week when I'm available. Those are the external things. Mm-hmm. But there are also um, plans that you have, notes that you take about things that are personal to you. So let's say um, somebody asked me to write a guest blog post. And so certainly for some people, they would open up a draft Microsoft Word document or an Evernote note and start brainstorming there. But I might be brainstorming in the 15 minutes when I am parked waiting for my client to show up for for their appointment. And so I'm not going to type on the teeny tiny keyboard on my phone, (laughs) which I I feel like I, I, I have like like Shrek hands. They're just so big when I use those little keyboards. I pull out my my legal pad and I start brainstorming ideas. But when I get home, I'm going to tuck that in the slot for the day that I have planned to start writing that guest post. So there are external resources, you know, pieces of paper that come in the mail that uh, um, you receive when you go to an appointment, things that are going to trigger action on your part Mm -hmm. and you're going to slot them in those days. And then there are things that you create that let's say, um, you know, you want to send birthday cards. What's really helpful Mm -hmm. is to buy, um, you know, a month's worth of birthday cards at a time and write them out and then put them in the Monday of the week you're going to mail them that slot. And this way, instead of having at the side of your desk, a pile of Mm to-dos. What you have are categorized, prioritized tasks. And I always say it's like having Jeeves the butler present you with your appointments for the day because you Mm -hmm. only have to look at the slot for that day. And then at the end of your day, you peek ahead and see what you've scheduled for yourself for the next day. I mean, there are all sorts of important tidbits to know about the tickler file, like, Tickler file is forward only. You can't just leave something undone in today's slot. If you get to the end of today's today's (laughs) slot, today today is done. You know, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, finish every day and be done with it. Tomorrow, you you have to figure out. Yeah, and it may be tomorrow, or it may be a week from today. It might be Mm -hmm. Monday, or you may revisit the whole concept and say, you know. I keep pushing this forward and I've been pushing it forward for a month. It's not a priority for me right now. I'm going to move it to July and revisit Absolutely. it yeah. with, with a fresh brain. Mm-hmm. I think people tend to be overwhelmed when they can't tell what something is. If you have a stack of papers, you can only tell what the top thing is. Everything else is like sedimentary rock-like layers where the (laughs) oldest stuff is on the bottom. But when you have a tickler file, because everything for a date this month is going into a slot this month, Mm -hmm. anything pushed forward is going to go to June or July. And when you get to the end of one month, you grab the next, you know, you're you're at the end of the the dated uh, slots you're gonna pull the things from the next month and start parceling them out to the appropriate dates. What mm-hmm. it does, you know, sometimes people will say, well, doesn't that violate the, the Ohio rule? I always hear that in organizing. Yeah, they only, only handle, handle it, it once. once, yeah. I, am, I have nothing against the state of Ohio, but the Ohio rule presumes that you have all of the knowledge and cognitive capacity you need to know what to do with something 
at the moment it enters your hand. And that's just not true. Mm -hmm. You know, think about you get you get in the shower and you find the solution while you're you're, you know, shampooing your hair to a problem that's been bothering you for three days. Your brain works differently in different locations at different times with different sensory inputs. So therefore, I like the fact that the tickler file makes you touch something more than once because mm -hmm. it guarantees that you have an opportunity for another spark of ingenuity yeah. to go along with it. You know, and I think that the Ohio rule, you know, make a decision once. You know, I, I think the problem that is attributed to handling it and touching it again and again and again, and again it's touching it and not making any decision. You know, you look at it, you sit it back over there. You look at it, just sit it back over there. You know, now you look at it and you go, hmm, to move forward on this, I need to call Joe. Joe is out of town until Saturday. I want to call Joe on Saturday. I'll put it in Saturday's file. Now it's out of sight. It's out of mind. It's not cluttering up other things that I could be doing today. And then on Saturday, automatically, there it is. You know, I, I just hate the refrigerator doors. You know, when you, you, you know, you come home from the dentist office with that little card that tells you you have an appointment a year from now and people stick a little magnet on the door with that card for next year. And they're all kind of little cards. So it's like every day you'd have to look at the refrigerator door to see what might be germane to today. And it all blends into the background. So when the appointment finally does roll around, it's, it's, you're likely to just overlook it. You know, it's, it's clutter blindness. And even though, you know, the de the dental office will probably, you know, now they, they have these automated robo oh, callers yes. that will, that will send, they'll send you a text or a call. But if you get that call on a Friday telling you that you have a Monday 8 a.m. dental appointment, you got to know, I don't make Monday 8 a.m. dental appointments because I'm right, not. Right, because you're not a morning person. But, but there's, there's nothing you can do about it at, at that point because there's been no context. There's been no thought about it. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, if all it is, is that, um, appointment, then it goes on your calendar. I, I, I tell people one of the biggest mistakes that I think happens with the digital calendars is that you have to go to so much effort to move forward because you're usually seeing a week at a time. Mm -hmm. Even if you see a month at a time, you say, okay, I know what my month is. But if the first of the month is on a Friday, you know, you don't flip to it until that Thursday, it's a midweek sort, sort of thing. And you could completely miss that, that you have an important deadline. Whereas uh, if you've got a paper calendar, um, you're more likely because you're scheduling appointments with some frequency to have gone to at least next month's uh -huh. page for, for something. But I always teach my clients who have relatively little experience using calendars, we put a notation on the calendar at the beginning of the, the last week. So if the last week of the month is, is like, you know, if that Monday is like next week is a partial week because it's the 30th and 31st. But so let's say on the 23rd, okay, put a note on that 23rd saying, look at next month, just a teeny thing just to have people flip to the next page. It is mind blowing mm -hmm. for several people because they realize this is something that they've innately never, you know, nothing has ever told them, look at next month before this month ends. But the minute you do it, you start getting not just the big picture, but you, you are start embracing the details little hooks in your brain have hangers on them going, okay, this is Thursday and this is Friday. And, and your, your brain is doing some of that labor in the background, making sure you don't forget about those things. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, no, and refrigerator I, doors are for children's artwork. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, and I think the people with the, the paper calendar, when you go to write something on it, you know, it makes you turn to that page, you know, when it's digital, 
we can we we can add it to our voice as we're walking down the street, which is a blessing. And it can be a curse. You know, you may well have just added something to your calendar right smack on top of something else or butting up against other things and, and your day's just crazy busy. Whereas if you had to put pencil to paper on that little square and you go, oh my gosh, I can't do this on Monday. Yeah, uh, your it, your it, DVR will, will warn you if you try to schedule. So the fancier ones now will let you record more, but I have a run of the mill DVR. Mm -hmm. I can only record two things simultaneously. Yeah. Uh, and now that a lot of networks will run a show one minute over, so it will end at 10.01 instead of 10, I will get conflict warnings. Yeah. Most digital calendars don't give you a conflict warning because they know that it's possible that you could have a lunch date with so-and-so mm -hmm. and have to drive to such and such a place and have a webinar that's an, and, and they just don't warn you. I want that conflict notice. Well, a paper calendar literally gives you the conflict notice because you need to find some sp some place in that box to write. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, Julie, in a previous conversation, you talked to me, I jotted down, how fear tends to drive us. How does that relate to organizing? I love that question. So when people say to me, I just don't know why I can't get organized. And, and sometimes it's about productivity, but more and more often it's about tangible organization. Over 20 years, I have developed this theory that Fear is at the heart of most obstacles to organization. People think they're lazy. They're not lazy. I mean, we're all a little bit lazy sometimes, but, but it's so many different kinds of fear preventing mm -hmm. us from moving forward. So I will say this, and I'll have a big burly male client who will say, I'm not afraid of anything. And I'll say, okay, well, let's, let's put a pin in that. Tell me about this drawer that is full of uh, pay stubs dating back to 1987. And they'll say, oh, well, I'm keeping those because I'm afraid I might get audited. And I put up my hand. <laughs> they don't even recognize that I'm afraid I might get audited. It's not, I'm afraid of clowns or I'm afraid of heights, but it is that anticipation of something going wrong. You anticipate that if you get organized, you won't be able to find something even though you couldn't find it already. It's that anticipation of feeling bad because you let go of something and it meant you had a connection to somebody. So for example, there's um, people fear getting rid of things that quote, they might need someday and they hold on to things, you can finish the sentence, just, just in, in case. case. Ah. They never, Frank, they never say just in case of what. So if I'm working with clients on paper clutter, people are afraid of letting go of receipts or EOBs or their check duplicates because they might get audited. Um, but I'll say, well, you know, your EOB isn't proof to the IRS of anything. Your EOB, your explanation of benefits from the insurance company, is a guide for you for what your doctor is allowed to charge and in theory, what your portion should be to pay. You can't turn around and show your EOB to the IRS and say, see, I spent $43,000 on medical expenses because it doesn't prove you spent it. It might prove you owe it, but I, that's, yeah. that's not the same thing. Um, it's not just paper. Um, there used to be a superstition. You might remember this, uh, you know, your grandmother might have told you this, that women would not let go of their maternity clothes because they were afraid that if they did that, they'd, they'd get pregnant. Honest to goodness, keeping your maternity clothes is not a form of contraception. People should no, be, no. be aware of this. Doesn't work. But, but I can't tell you the number of women who have their maternity clothes and their youngest children are in medical school or have grandchildren. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like people 
have this fear of being without something that they may need. Mm -hmm. And it blocks them from thinking about why they would need it, when they would need it, how much they would need, and so on. So um, that's sort of a trigger. That fear makes me say, okay, let's walk through. Here in the middle of this stack of papers that dates back, the, the thing on the bottom is from 2013. There's an article about what to do if you have aphids in your garden. And they're like, oh yeah, that was a really good article. And I'm like, okay, do you have you had aphids in your garden over these last nine years? And mm -hmm. either they'll say yes or no. If they say yes, I'll say, did you go look for this article? And they're like, well, no, I forgot I had it. Yeah, I, I, just, I just did a Google search and found it, yeah. It, exactly. Yeah. And so it's like, if you have something, but you can't find it, you don't know where it is, it's exactly the same as not having it. You, you so, read my mind, I, I say all the time, if, if, if you can't find your information, you might as well not have it. I mean, that's just one of my little, you know, little, little sayings. And, <laughs> and the clutter hides the good stuff. Oh my gosh, that's you know, so true. You got right? great stuff you can't find because you, of all the stuff that and it's like well you know it's not hurting anything yes it is it's taking up valuable real estate it's living rent free it, it's a freeloader you know? <laughs> <laughs> squatters it, it, they're it's squatters adding, it's adding no value to your life and it's taking up space that could be used for something else well, that's that's so true. Um, another fear, I, I hear this from my creatives all the time, from the writers, the artists, the photographers. Um, they fear that having an orderly environment is going to stifle their creativity. And this actually comes, you know, th this instinct is, is innate, but then they, they think that they have research to back it up because there was an article from the University of Minneapolis like a decade ago that it was, it was based on a study done with 48 students and they, they had, they were put in, half were put in messy rooms and half were put in tidy rooms. And then um, they had to come up with unconventional uses for ping pong paddles. Okay? Hmm. And the students okay. who were in tidy rooms, uh, like, rooms that, that were not just like overwhelmed with clutter um, came up with fewer ideas than the ones in, in chaotic rooms. Right, yeah. It was 48 students. It, 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 there, there, were, there was no control group. It wasn't a scientific peer-reviewed academic study. It was just a thing. Mm -hmm. What they failed to take into account is they probably set it up so, so that there were a variety of other variables for which they hadn't controlled, like temperature in the room and lighting and time of day and all of these things. But it all comes down to the fact that creativity comes in a variety of guises. And if you can't find the tools for your cre creativity, whether that's mm -hmm. artistic, literary, photographic, culinary, okay, you have this incredible inspiration to, to bake a cake with chocolate ganache on top. But if you don't have the ingredients and mm -hmm. it's raining out and you don't want to go out, you're just not going to do that creative endeavor. It's it's not the fee, just that fear of physical order that creates the fear of loss of creativity. People, I'm sure you see this, fear that they can't be creative unless they've got pressure, they need that deadline. I'm, I'm sure mm -hmm. you heard people say, oh, oh, no, I can't work a little bit all the time. I'm only creative if I do something, if I've got that pressure of a deadline. And I always say, how do you know if you only ever do things the night before they're due? You, I'm sure you saw this with your students. and, and, and All with, the time, all and, the and, time, yeah. And, and, and these sorts of things that if you give somebody a deadline to do something that's two weeks ahead of when it's actually due and they, they work on it up to that deadline that they think they had, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you tell them, oh no, you actually have two more weeks. 
So this would, you know, their, their attitude is, oh, well, I could have done better, but, but, you know, I have this deadline. You give them two more weeks and literally they're not going to look at it again until right before the actual mm-hmm. deadline. So then these are sort of, sort of, I want to say they can be intellectual fears, fear of not having what you need, fear, fear of not being able to do something, but there are fears of letting go of things because people are afraid of the emotions that they're going to be. So um, people will say, oh, well, my grandmother gave this to me. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, af- I'm afraid that if I let go of it, I'm going to feel guilty. Or more often people will say, oh, I can't let go of that because my grandmother gave it to me. And I'll say, do you use it? No. Mm-hmm. Do you like it? No. Is it serving a use for you? No. So why can't you let go of it? And I have to sort of hold them by the hand and say, I think you're afraid that letting go of the item is like letting go of the relationship. You may feel that you are betraying your loved one. So very often I'll use this example. Okay. See that best tennis player coffee mug you are drinking out of. And they'll say, yeah. I'm like, how would you feel if your kids and your grandkids and your great grandkids felt that they had to keep that forever because Mm -hmm. it was yours and it got passed down to them. And there's this look of terror that comes over most people because the last thing they want to do is re revisit or, or force that sense of obligation and that likelihood of clutter on, on future generations, Uh, that fear that letting go of things let's go of the attachment to the people can be very powerful. So I have to always remind people, love the people, but understand that people aren't things. Now, if Mm -hmm. you put on your grandfather's watch and it reminds you of going to church and him getting dressed and putting on his tie and putting on his watch or your grandmother's antique silver hairbrush is, is uh, on the dresser and it reminds you of her getting ready for birthday dinners. I think that's wonderful. That's powerful and it's meaningful. But as I say to all my clients, if it's broken and not repaired, mm-hmm. if it's in a box, under a box, shoved in a closet under the <laughs> stairs, it's not something that's valuable to you. You are fearing losing a connection to a person, when your connection to that person is so much stronger than anything that that object can represent. And then there's fear related to money. And I think that's a combination of the intellectual fear of, oh, I don't know whether I'm I'm going to need this in the future, and so I'm gonna hold on to it. Mm -hmm. And the emotional fear, because nobody wants to feel stupid. Yeah. And there's, you know, the sunk cost fallacy. It's why people hold on to broken things, to gadgets they yet never use. Um, old cars, old computers. Oh my goodness. Computers that are still using DOS and people, people hold on to them uh, because they had put so much money into whatever the thing is. Just like people hold on to broken relationships they put so much effort into, <laughs> even though they're not going in. Even though they're not enjoying it. Yeah. Right. It, it, it's, it's no va- adding no value. Right. And so people have, you know, all of these fears come down to this, this fear of the unknown. They're afraid that they are going to need something they don't have, that they're going to lose an emotion, emotional connection, that they are going to feel embarrassed, they are going to feel like they made the wrong decision. And people would rather stick with the devil they know than the devil they don't know. Mm -hmm. But all that stuff that's buried in in that clutter that you're thinking is, is the devil you know is causing you to build up the devils you don't know. Think about people who don't check their email or even their tangible mail because they're afraid of bad news. They're afraid of bills. They don't go to the, they won't make a doctor's appointment. Okay. It might be bad news. Because there might be bad news. 
if you did, there are people who won't start work with an organizer. They, they want the end result. They want to be organized, but they are so afraid of what the process is going to bring up that mm-hmm. they are going to feel embarrassed about the clerk, which is why I say, don't apologize, organize. Oh, yeah. they're, they're so afraid that something dark and, and adverse is going to pop up during that organizing process that, that they put it off. So that when we do go through the organizing process, people are like, why did I put this off for so long? And it's not necessarily about just right. working with a professional organizer or, or a time management coach, but it's about taking control of your life and understanding that what you fear probably doesn't exist. Now, it may exist in a smaller form mm-hmm. or a less impactful form, but you're never going to know. You can never conquer your fears if you don't face your fears. So again, I am not a mental health professional. Um, we professional organizers are very clear that unless, like if somebody is a former nurse or, or, uh, or has a uh, you know, clinical experience. So I am not, I'm a former television executive. So these are, these are things that, which is, which is just kookyville. (laughs) But what I, this comes from my experience that fear is what is driving the continued acceptance of clutter and conquering that fear starts by facing it. Um, And sometimes that is as simple as taking one baby step and looking at the first five pieces of paper on that pile or opening up that box that has been in the corner since you moved or or getting a calendar, even though you fear that scheduling things is going to make you um, ignore the muse. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So so lots lots of fear, but everybody can conquer it. Absolutely. Yes. Julie, this has been wonderful. Um, lots that'll go in the show notes, uh, you know, all of the things that we've talked about, links to things, but kind of as the, where is the one best place for people to go to sort of get to know you better? Well, that would be my website, which is easy because it's my name. It's juliebestry.com, J-U-L-I-E. B-E-S-T-R-Y dot com. My blog is there. I have been blogging as Paper Doll since 2007. There are articles. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, there are all sorts of things which really give you a sense of my sense of humor, um, my sense of compassion and lack of judgment. And there are things, you know, somebody doesn't necessarily have to hire me to get a value out of um, what's at my website because there are lots and lots of articles. And Frank, as you know, from talking with me, you know, I have a lot of words. I write really long blog posts, but <laughs> to, today's blog post was about what you should and shouldn't keep in, um, in a safe deposit box. And, Ooh, okay. and so that, that's, you know, that's so, one, yeah. but, but literally it's going to be a surprise each week to people who come to the blog because yeah. I do cover such a variety of topics, not necessarily only related to paper, but as I am paper doll, paper and paper related. Paper is your specialty. Including those little green pieces of paper that that you keep in your wallet because helping people save those is what comes out of being organized and productive. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Well, Julie Bestry, thank you so much for being on the show. And I... For for those who follow me, they know this is a solo show. I, I, I don't have guests, but yet for the second time in a week, I'm recording a uh, a non solo show. I'm having a guest and Leslie Josell, who you had put Leslie on my radar, and I'm not sure which episode will air first, whether it will be yours or hers, but um, both of these have been wonderful. Uh, I appreciate your time, and to everybody out there, don't apologize. Organize!
organize. This has been Frank Buck and Julie Bestry, uh, helping you get organized and make it look easy. So until next time, go and have the time of your life.